Okay, well, I wanted to ask you, first of all, to start off asking you how you think uh, Zionism has corrupted Judaism, not Judaism, the Jewish identity in the modern world from within. I wanted to, uh, there's one writer named Mark Ellis uses the term Constantinian Judaism to describe the transformation. He basically speaks of Constantinian Judaism to evoke like a turn in Judaism towards serving state power and secular power at the expense of keeping up an authentic uh, tradition and a diasporic tradition. And so, you know, just as, as Christianity was, was corrupted by, by Constantine's and the, the assumption of state power by Christianity, this has not happened with how Judaism is practiced in the modern world. Uh, let me introduce myself first of all. I'm uh, Dr. Abraham uh, Weisfeld. My full name, my full Jewish name is uh, Abraham Yechesko Weisfeld Goldscheider. And uh, I come from a Yiddish background uh, in uh, Poland. Uh, my parents uh, each came from Poland uh, before the Holocaust and uh, Warsaw lived in. And my first language, consequently, is Yiddish. Uh, although I was born in Toronto, I was conceived in a refugee camp in uh, Breslau, in Germany, after the war. My parents survived in the uh, Soviet Union during the war. Now. Uh, Zionism is an aberration of both uh, Judaism and Jewish political culture. It does not originate within uh, either Judaism or Jewish political culture. The, uh, what Mark Ellis refers to as Constantinian Judaism is merely a consequence of the uh, corruption of Judaism and Jewish political culture by Zionism, which originates in Europe. Zionism did not originate in the uh, Jewish Arab political culture, it originated in the European Jewish political culture. The reason for which was that the European nation state, which was a Christian nation state, never provided for Jewish uh, liberty within the context of those uh, countries, even though they claimed to be developing democracy. Now, what the French Revolution provided in terms of uh, liberties were not extended to the Jewish people until the advent of uh, the Napoleonic Code even. And even then, the Napoleonic Code only provided for individual uh, Jewish uh, civil rights as a citizen, but not as a Jewish citizen. That is, there were no collective Jewish rights, and uh, individual Jewish uh, citizens were subject to discrimination for being Jewish in uh, practically a legal manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why Dreyfus was uh, uh, discriminated against and targeted as a, as a spy, merely because he had some relations with in Germany. When in fact, it was uh, uh, another French officer who had equally Jewish relations in Germany, who sympathized with Germany and was a spy, and uh, who was not Jewish. Mm -hmm. But uh, even then, at that time, I believe, it was necessary for Jews in France to convert to being Christians in order to have a position as an officer in the uh, French military. Much the same way that Spain, uh, under the Christian rule of uh, Queen Isabella, uh, re required uh, Spanish Jews, Latino Jews, to convert to Christianity if they wanted to have any higher position in civil service. And even then, they were called uh, conversos or new Christians and eventually uh, either expelled, deported, or executed mm -hmm. for having been Jewish at some point previously in their family's history. So it demonstrated that the nation-state concept was a European concept only and it defined the nation in religious terms. This affected the Jewish political culture tremendously and eventually led uh, to the Holocaust, which uh, considered that the uh, nation-state of Germany uh, would not tolerate any other nation but a German nation that was defined in religious Christian terms. Mm -hmm. So the Lutheran revolution of the Reformation created an independent nation-state 
that was independent in the German sense of the Holy Roman Empire, of the authority of the Pope in Rome, by means of creating a, a Protestant religious stream called Lutheranism, which had as its motivation the creation of an independent political entity, providing liberty for the German people, but in a very discriminatory way. Now, Zionism concluded that this uh, historical methodology was necessary. They considered it a, it a historical necessity to do so. And they adopted the same methodology and said that, well, if the Christians are going to establish their own nation state in their own name, then the Jewish people should do the same and establish a Jewish nation state in their own name, excluding any other nation, just as the Jews have been excluded from Germany and from Europe. And they, uh, because they realized that, you know, the Jewish liberty in Europe was not feasible under such a Christian nation state. So instead of opposing the Christian nation state, they adopted the same methodology and chose to implement it in their own name with the alliance of those Christian nation states, mm -hmm. which considered that the Jews didn't belong in their Christian nation state, and therefore the Jews should go to their Jewish nation state and incidentally form an outpost of European colonization. Mm -hmm. That's the true origin of Zionism. And this has corrupted Jewish political culture, and in particular, it has destroyed a great part of the Jewish political culture, in particular, the Yiddish language. Now, I'm a Yiddish speaker who can speak with nobody. Nobody speaks Yiddish except for the Hasidim, mm -hmm. who we could only use you know, Yiddish at home as an oral language, because Hebrew is a sacred language. It's used for reading the Sefer Torah. It was never meant, you know, to be a language to be used orally. In fact, even the ancient Israelites did not speak Hebrew as a daily oral language. They spoke Aramaic. Hmm. So, Zionism comes along and says, oh, that they're going to uh, um, adopt the legitimization, the legitimacy of, the, of uh, some passages in the Torah, which were edited by Ezra, incidentally, and uh, claim Hebrew as a justification for establishing such a Jewish nation state in the land that was not even ancient Israel. Tel Aviv is not, is not situated in where ancient Israel was, uh, was located. Actually, the West Bank is where ancient Israel is. Ancient Israel, the kingdoms of, Zion, of, uh, of David and Solomon were located in the West Bank. Okay, and even then, they were only located in a pluralistic fashion. There were various nations who lived together in that kingdom. There was no nation state established at that time. Yeah, it didn't exist. It didn't exist as a concept. Yeah. And the kingdom that existed was a, a small kingdom that incorporated many other nations and incorporated these other nations even in the family of Solomon himself, in terms of the, his various wives from the different nations who he married in order to provide for various peace pacts and treaties, which provided for the stability of the of society at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was a pluralistic society and not a nation state in any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you said what would have been, you know, instead of Zionism going off and establishing its own nation state on the model of the European ex exclusionary nation states, what would have been a way for them to stay in an opponent, to stay in fight? Well, in Poland, the, uh, the Jewish workers movement formed a civil rights movement in much the same way that the African Americans did, and they developed it into a political party and a trade union federation called the Jewish Bund, mm -hmm. Jewish Labor Bund, or the General Union of Jewish Workers in Latvia and Russia in Poland. And my mother was a member of the Bund, and so was uh, her, her brother, uh, who became a partisan during the uh, Nazi invasion of Russia. And uh, this Jewish uh, Bund, which means union, uh, was of the opinion that the Jewish people who lived in Poland were uh, legitimately Polish, as legitimate as any other Polish person. They had lived there for over 500 years. They spoke Polish. They spoke Polish to each other even in their home, mm -hmm. as well as Yiddish. My parents spoke to each other in Polish, not Yiddish. With me, they spoke in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. They were as Polish as any other Polish person, only they were Jewish as well. They had a dual identity, because to be Jewish is to have a national identity as well as a religion. Not every Jewish person uh, is necessarily religious or of the same brand of religion, religious practice, 
Therefore, the common denominator is a national identity, not a religious identity. The fact that Jewish people are one of the least religious nations in the world nowadays, only about 20% of Jewish people are religious, but the Jewish national identity continues to exist. And the Jewish Bund was based upon this national identity. They did not take an anti-religious position, they took a non-religious position. So uh, Jews of uh, various currents uh, were members without any problem. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and that that itself is a bit of a, a secular person right wing concept, maybe the idea that uh, that there is a national identity separate from religious identity, a very ability to take a non-religious cultural perspective is maybe a modern. Uh, it was modern, what was called Haskalah yeah. in in, uh, in Yiddish or Hebrew, the modernist trend, mm -hmm. which was not anti-religious necessarily. Uh, Spinoza developed this uh, this uh, methodology mm -hmm. in which he incorporated uh, modern scientific thought and methodology and uh, provided an update, basically, of Judaism, which uh, allowed Judaism to adopt uh, newer ideas uh, without uh, contradicting or uh, casting aside the traditional uh, ideas and values. Mm -hmm. So, the Jewish Bund developed on the civil rights basis as an alternative to Zionism. In fact, it was anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a member of the um, Russian Social Democratic Party, the Revolutionary Socialist Party, which incorporated both the, uh, what became the Bolsheviks, what was the Mensheviks, and the third component was the Jewish Bund. But the Jewish yeah, Bund... Yeah, yeah. It was on an equal level at first with Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Not equal, it was greater. You know, the Jewish Bund had 35,000 members in 1903. The Iskra group of Lenin had 8,000 members only. Mm -hmm. The Mensheviks had something equal to that. Mm -hmm. The Jewish Bund was enormous compared to the other the revolutionary tendencies. That's why in 1903, both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks united at the opening of the Congress to expel the Jewish Bund. That was their first action. Really? It was the first action that you needed? The first resolution, yes. Without notice, they were set up. They were expelled from the Congress the inter and uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the party, the Social Democratic Revolutionary Socialist Party. And uh, then the division between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks took place afterwards. And because the Jewish Bund had been expelled, the Bolsheviks ended up being a majority. Otherwise, they would have remained a minority of the Congress. Why are the Bolsheviks? I mean, say, why was the Bund expelled? Why did they? Why did uh, they why? Both the uh, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks adopted the Marxist definition of, uh, of of nationhood. They considered a nation to be a state. They were status, as Marx was a statist. Marx was a young Hegelian, and Hegel developed the concept of nation state. Mm -hmm. and the state itself, from which he considered the civil society to be subordinate to the state. This is an error, a fundamental error of Marxism, which led to the Bolsheviks actually adopting the same form of the bourgeois state which was developing in Russia under the Tsar. Mm -hmm. The state that the Bolsheviks took over and, and, uh, and perpetuated had the same frontiers as before, had the same centralized administration as before, the same centralized army under Trotsky as before, mm -hmm. and this led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The first thing they did in 1926 is they dissolved the Soviets, even though the slogan of the revolution was all power to the Soviets. Mm -hmm. So, after expelling the Bund, they dissolved the Soviets when the revolution succeeded. Then, really, like years after 1917. Yes. Yeah. You see, it was all part of the same formula of what a, uh, power is. They defined power as a state apparatus in which there was a party that was supposed to be implementing a dictatorship of the proletariat in, in the form of the state. And who was to represent the state? The party. Which party? One party, the Communist Party, because there's only one class, and the class is supposed to be a unified working class without any differentiation. In other words, workers were supposed to abandon their national identity and that's why the Bund was expelled in 1903. Even though the Bund continued to exist, 
And uh, the Bund uh, supported, gave uh, strategic and tactical support to the Russian Revolution, even though it was being led by the Bolsheviks. And the Bund came and offered its support to the Bolshevik uh, government. And uh, what happened is that uh, Stalin, in uh, 1936, I believe, actually arrested the leaders of the Bund, Ehrlich and Nauter, because they had formed that Jewish anti-fascist committee, which is an independent uh, committee, independent of the Communist Party. And Stalin would not allow any political formations that were independent of the Communist Party. He arrested the leaders, put the Jewish communists in their place, to take over the Jewish anti-fascist committee, put them in prison, and uh, interrogated them. Ehrlich, you know, wrote a great deal uh, at that time, which needs to be published. But eventually he was executed. No, it's not published yet. An altar committed suicide a couple of years after that. So, uh, and the Nazis, of course, destroyed the uh, near entire membership of the Jewish Bund in Warsaw, etc. So the Bund was uh, devastated by both the Nazis and by the Stalinists. But it survived nonetheless. And here I am. You know, I was raised as a Bundist by my mother secretly anti-Zionist. My mother was my secret collaborator against the Zionist movement in Toronto when I started the campaign to criticize the Zionist uh, leadership in Toronto as early as 1966-67. So the communists couldn't um, handle the boon having a, a dual identity as full members of the working class struggle, but also having a separate autonomous national identity as Jews. That's right, precisely. And they could not tolerate uh, neither the Ukrainian working class having its own identity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mahmoud, who was an anarchist leader, was leading the uh, Ukrainian revolution against the White Army and the Russian Revolution. He was not allowed the autonomy of the Ukrainian people, but even by Trotsky. Mm -hmm. Trotsky offered to integrate, you know, the uh, Mahmovichny who were the anarchist fighters against the White Army, the Tsarist Army, into the Red Army. And he offered Machno a position as a general. Mm -hmm. Machno turned this position down because he wanted to maintain the autonomy of the Ukrainian forces because they were fighting for an independent Ukraine. They always wanted an independent Ukraine from the Tsarist Empire, and they still wanted independence, you know, of the Ukraine from the Bolshevik Empire, which is basically the same empire as the Tsarist Empire, the same frontiers. Mm -hmm. So, Bolshevism adopted the same form as the Tsarist Empire, the same state, the same frontiers, mm -hmm. the same repression, mm -hmm. and that eventually led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. One of the major factors was uh, uh, national rebellions against uh, uh, Russian uh, control or influence in their countries, in particular Afghanistan. Yeah. But so it's interesting how the how whereas the boom sought to maintain uh, the uh, duality, a dual identity between you know national identity as Jews, but also for participation in the Polish struggle or the Russian struggle, the Latvian struggle, Zionism and Palestine attempted to collapse those that duality into a single you know, identity, whereas we're states, we're society, we're, we're one. Where the, the national Jewish identity you know, immediately coincided with the uh, yes. membership in the state. With the yes. yes. You know, the Zionists are so fanatical on that point, they don't even allow an Israeli identity to be established. There is no such thing as, as, as an Israeli national identity in Israel. There is only a Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. Even though two thirds of the Jewish people in the world do not have a vote in, in the Israel elections, mm -hmm. they're taxed. Nonetheless, by the Jewish National Fund, mm -hmm. but they don't have the vote. Mm -hmm. So Jewish Americans, for instance, are uh, taxed without the vote. And in, in Jewish American in, in American history, this is called taxation without representation, and it was the major reason why there was an American Revolution against the British colonial empire. Mm -hmm. So that's why I advocated a Jewish revolution against Zionism mm -hmm. for the independence of the Jewish people from the state of the Zionists. Because it's not a state of the Jewish people. This is not a Jewish nation state. Mm -hmm. In reality, this is a Zionist nation state mm -hmm. or a Zionist state. They don't, you know, there may be an Israeli nation now, mm -hmm. 
but it is not a Jewish nation. It is an Israeli nation, and it is a Zionist, and it is, uh, does not represent the Jewish people. And by the way, I use the term Jewish. The Jew is an American term, which derives from a British uh, insult to the Jewish people. In the 1933 edition of the Oxford Dictionary, you will find Jew defined as an insult. Really? Yes. In fact, that's what the Nazis used to define uh, the Jewish people as an insult. You know, in the yellow star that was imposed mm -hmm. upon everybody to wear, yeah. and, and in the center it said Yid. Yid means Jew. Jew. Mm -hmm. It's an insult. But, but the alternative term would be Jewish. So, the word it's an adjective, you know. There is no such, there is no such thing as a Jew. It is, not, it is not an entity in and of itself. There is a Jewish person because we are people. We are not an object. The term Jew is an objectification of Jewish people in terms of alienation theory. Mm -hmm. So, what would your Jewish revolution again be? Is it Zionism be? It would be international Jewish. We have formed an international Jewish opposition to Zionism now. There are various Jewish organizations mm -hmm. that are either anti-occupation or anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. There is, for instance, now even the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network mm -hmm. that was uh, initiated uh, in the United States and now extends uh, elsewhere. There is the Jewish Voice for Peace, which is very principled. There is J Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, altogether, the number of members of these various organizations in the United States alone is 190,000. The Zionists have only 130,000 members in the United States. No. We are now stronger than the Zionist movement. Really? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, the official members of the Zionists. That's right. The and the Zionist probably. organizations. But they have a lot of supporters and sympathizers yeah. who donate, and etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are not, you know, uh, the Zionists per se. In fact, the fact that all of these Jewish Americans live outside of the Zionist state defines them as, objectively speaking, non-Zionist. Mm -hmm. Although they're not anti-Zionist for sure. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they refuse the Zionist ideological imperative of going to live in the state that the Zionists have created means that they are non-Zionist. They have no intention of going to live there. And until recently, even uh, only 20% of Jewish Americans even bothered to go to visit Israel. Until recently, until until uh, programs like Birthright, because mm -hmm. they realized, you know, that this was a big problem for them to maintain their ideological hegemony. Mm -hmm. So they uh, brought you know young Jewish Americans over to be indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So back in uh, um, in Russia, there was a time when the, the Jewish community was split between Buddhism and Zionism. You know, where they almost polar. Uh, Opposed their tendencies, and one advocating you know, diaspora and involvement in the international struggle, and one advocating separatism. Yes, they were separatists, segregationists. They wanted to segregate the Jewish people in Israel. They wanted the Polish Jewish people to leave Poland and go to uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even though their own members didn't do so, and very few you know, people actually did go to Palestine at that age. Mm -hmm. And in the 1936 municipal elections, the uh, Jewish Bund uh, got more votes than the Zionists. Mm. It was a stronger political tendency. Mm. So you 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 believe that to effectively combat Zionism from within the Jewish people, it's necessary to to craft a new Jewish identity. That you know because the modern Jewish identity is so bound up right now with the Zionist state of Israel. I remember you were telling me before that it's necessary really to recraft or what it means to be Jewish. Well, I think that reasserting Jewish identity is uh, the problematic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a Jewish American culture is very strong. Mm -hmm. It's not Israeli. It's not Zionist. Mm -hmm. It is Jewish. And it is also American. Mm -hmm. And has contributed greatly to American uh, political culture as well. But it is nonetheless Jewish. I know there is this tendency, you know, of the melting pot by States mm -hmm. that if you're American, you're American, you're American. But it happens to be that Jewish Americans are also Jewish in spite of all of that. Mm -hmm. So this has to be asserted, you know, in an independent fashion. And uh, Jewish identity has to be rebuilt mm -hmm. without uh, feigning uh, uh, allegiance, you know, to, to the Zionist state, mm -hmm. which is artificial. And it does not is not representative of the actual the actuality of Jewish political culture. 
in uh, North America or any other country like France, England, South Africa, or Australia, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just, you know, is, is false. It has no truth to it. The Israelis can keep and develop their identity, which is very much also a Palestinian identity, even though they don't yeah. realize it. Things like Hamas and... Yes, Islam. you know, where do they get this from? Yeah. You know, if they say that this is the ancient Israelite culture, then it's the Palestinians who have preserved this culture and not the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Jewish people in part, you know, with Passover and all that, you know, but, uh, you know, the Palestinians, in fact, are more representative of ancient uh, Jewish culture than, uh, you know, modern Jewish uh, societies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you will find in history that if you choose to make any research on the matter, that a large percentage of the Palestinian people are actually ancient Jewish people. Yeah, converted to Islam. When converted to Islam. Islam. Or who did not convert to Islam. Like the Jewish uh, Palestinians who live on top of the mountain over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Sumerians. Yeah. You know, they're still there. Yeah. 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 But a large part of you, you aim to make a, a, a new international boom. Can you tell me about yeah. that? Yes, that's uh, the, the major point that uh, remains to be. Uh, uh, elaborated, um, the political re voice for the new, for the resurgent Jewish identity has to be the Jewish Bund. One, because the Jewish Bund was proven correct in its critique of Zionism, in the sense that it was not necessary for Jewish people to run away to Palestine in order to preserve their identity. Jewish people are not going to be assimilated. Mm -hmm. Jewish people maintain their identity even though they live as uh, members of other societies. Jewish people are strong enough uh, to be able to maintain a dual identity. The concept of a dual identity is missing from Zionism and also the Christian nation-state concept. You can have more than one identity. You can speak more than one language. Mm -hmm. You know, humans are not limited to being just one thing. You know, that is just an objectification of what it is to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. To be Jewish is to be creative, is to develop new ideas, to adopt new ideas, to learn from other cultures, and to um, fuse them with what the Jewish people have developed from the various cultures that we have learned from, to develop uh, an internationalist culture which is very dynamic mm -hmm. and has helped to bring about even the Renaissance in Europe because we've transmitted the knowledge of the Middle East to Europe. Oh, really? Yes, because the Europeans uh, had suppressed the knowledge of the Middle East. For instance, the library in Alexandria was burned by the Romans, Mark Anthony, one time. The second time it was burned by the Arab Christians who adopted the Christianity at Why? the time of 600 uh, AD. Why did they do that? Ah, because no other book but the Gospels was supposed to be read by people. Oh, so, Greek, yeah. so all the other books you know, were considered to be pagan. Yeah. It, even the scientific books were considered to be pagan, and they were burned. Although you know they were smuggled out, you know, by the intelligentsia at the time. In particular, there was a woman philosopher at the Library of Alexandria in 600 AD who helped preserve the knowledge of the Middle East. And there's a film about her called Agora, very important film. All her books were burnt. None of her books survived. She was also a scientist and an astronomer. She developed a, um, uh, an elaboration of a sun-centric uh, theory of the solar system as well, after Aristarchus the Greek. And uh, she developed the theory of elliptical orbits, you know, very important advanced scientific knowledge. And her name was... Uh, uh, Philiton. Uh, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but it should be researched further. Yes. So, it is the Jewish people who, who were able to transmit the suppressed culture of the Middle East into Europe, and this is what helped to produce the Renaissance in terms of the writings of Aristotle, etc., which were then brought from, uh, from uh, the preserved transcripts. Yes. And uh, as you might know, the earliest uh, version of the Sefer Torah was only preserved uh, in Greek from Alexandria. Yeah, you know, it's, it was translated into Greek. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. So, you know, you know, Jewish people have been very crucial in terms of uh, preserving their own culture and that of others as well. You know? mm. Now, the Jewish Bund has to reassert itself and develop this alternative international to the Zionist international. Mm-hmm. We are in the process of doing so. The various Jewish Bund chapters uh, everywhere now, but we're not united. Mm-hmm. And we have to seek a way to do so from an international. Mm-hmm. And that, obviously, the Bund was a socialist organization that was against uh, capitalism and imperialism. Yes. And so would that be a, a crucial... Yes, I still think it is, yes. Even though the Jewish working class is much smaller than it was, or has become transformed into a class of intellectual workers, mm-hmm. nonetheless, we work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And the same transformation is happening with other Yes, other groups of course, yeah. yeah. So all the working classes are being transformed, you know, mm-hmm. not just the Jewish working class. Yeah. You know, uh, Marx thought that uh, most of the Jewish people were bourgeois, because he knew, he only saw, you know, Jewish uh, bourgeois people in Germany. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people now, they say that the Jewish people are only middle class, you know. But both of these conceptions are stereotypes and they're wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, as many other people, you know, Jewish people are predominantly, uh, you know, working people. Uh, perhaps, you know, very well-educated working people. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, uh, you know, professionals, you know, who work at one thing or another and are intellectual workers, you know, if not, you know, ordinary workers. And, uh, uh, you know, the problem of organizing these workers, the new workers, uh, presents itself not only for the Jewish people, but for any other people as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the level of uh, unionization in the United States is very low. It's like 15%. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the same thing holds true, you know, for the Jewish people. Now, we have to organize ourselves independently of the Zionist International, independently of the Jewish bourgeoisie, which supports the Zionist International, it's basically their political party in various forms. And we have to reassert the Jewish identity both in terms of our political culture, in terms of the contributions we've made to socialist theory of the various Jewish uh, political prophets, so to speak. Uh, also, uh, in terms of uh, uh, social theory, in terms of civil rights movements, and in particular the concept of national cultural autonomy which should be practiced not only for the Jewish people, but also for other national minorities as well, so we can form federated societies in which the civil society becomes independent of the state. And in that way, we can have true democracy for everyone. Mm. So it's a a national cultural uh, autonomy autonomy as as an ethnic or a culture. It's a concept that allows for a plurality of different cultures to exist autonomously side by side, not impinging on the rights of other cultures, but it allows human beings also to have multiple identities. Yes, multiple languages, you know, uh, mm-hmm. independent uh, religious expressions, theocratic, you know, thought if they wish. And, mm-hmm. and uh, in, in uh, the system of coexistence is the political term we use, in terms of a federation based upon what is called mutual aid. Mm-hmm. That was like Kropotkin's. Yes. Term, right? But the concept uh, of uh, federation comes from uh, Proudhon, the French anarchist theorist, who wrote a book called The Federal Principle. Mm. But he never elaborated in terms of national identity. The anarchists, you know, missed out on recognizing that civil society was composed of various national uh, communities. Mm-hmm. And that was an idea that was, you know, given testament to in the, in the 20th century by various revolutions that, that occurred, that were articulated on nationalist lines in some sense. You know, I mean, uh, cultures used their, the, the, you know, their own distinctive traditions to, to revolt against you know, imperialism that was trying to homogenize them. Communism also, which is... Yes, but there are limitations to that particular series of revolts because they were based upon the, uh, the Leninist and the Wilsonian President Wilson's concept of self-determination. But what those meant by self-determination was self-determination as a nation-state, that is, separatism. Now, although Lenin you know, said, yes, nations have a right to separate, he was opposed to it for the reasons of for maintaining links of the working class, which was well motivated, but he had no real mechanism to do so. And eventually, of course, uh, these nations chose to separate because they were not offered any alternative in a federation. 
and uh, they became nation states in and of themselves, like Ukraine is now, mm -hmm. separate. And then the same problems they imposed upon the national minorities within Ukraine or within you know, any other newly uh, independent nation state, which then chose to oppress their national minorities, just as they themselves were oppressed previously because they were falling under the mythology of a nation state. So the concept of self-determination is flawed and needs to be critiqued because it is based upon the nation-state concept. One has to substitute the concept of auto-determination, which is autonomous self-determination, mm. rather than determination only for oneself in an individualistic sense, only for the one. Mm. Rather, one should seek um, one's uh, auto-determination in conjunction with the same principle of auto-determination on the part of other social formations as well. Mm. And this includes women. Women have to have their own auto-determination. But uh, to say that women should separate from men and have their own independent society, which, which that would mean, in effect, you know, the extension of the species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so the logic of it you know, doesn't make any sense when you look at it in that context. So yeah. one has to find another way to achieve a determination of a given social formation, which is autonomous, has power for itself, is not subordinate to any other social formation, yet coexists in the same society. So would that so could an example of this opposition also be found in the Black Civil Rights Movement in the sixties, where one one group, you know, uh, called for you know for black civil rights in America, whereas one group claimed to, to go back to Africa. Yeah, the Garvey has been yeah. saying, you know, Liberia, Liberia turned out to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a sort of a Zionist concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes, yes, it's similar. Yes. And the civil rights movement uh, was basically a movement for integration, mm -hmm. which is what we want, you know, for national minorities, but not assimilation. Mm -hmm. So that's the Buddhist concept too. Integration, but not assimilation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Basically, because assimilation is impossible, it was tried previously mm -hmm. in uh, Isabella, Spain, and in uh, Dreyfus's France. Mm -hmm. it did not work. Mm -hmm. You know, liberal democracy does not work. We have to have a federated democracy, mm -hmm. which recognizes the existence of various differing social formations. Mm -hmm. So it, would be a, it seemed to be an ideal time for a boom to be resurrected, and right now with. You know, like with uh, this seems to, to be a growing discontent among all peoples of the world, whether it's the Arabs, spring or the Aki kind of movement, that in one way or another is beginning to articulate discontent with capitalism. And, you know, capitalism in the Occupy Wall Street sense, where the verdict is still out of exactly who, 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 where the battle line is going to be drawn, but also the Arab Spring is, you know, uh, riding against imperialism in some ways. Yes. And so they boomed by combating both of those and come. Yeah, Zionism in, in many ways seems to encapsulate capitalism and imperialism, perhaps. And, uh, yes, I mean, yeah. you know, the the naive uh, socialist Zionists thought that they were form forming a socialist country when they formed the Zionist state, mm -hmm. but uh, that soon uh, dissolved into uh, ordinary, uh, you know, capitalist the economy, which uh, gradually uh, rolled back the various social welfare programs, which is what the Occupy. Uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem movements are all about it now. Mm -hmm. Because you know, war became more important than social programs. Mm -hmm. Even though war, war with the Palestinians is not necessary. The Palestinians are not waging war on Israel. It's Israel which is waging war on the Palestinians. Every day here we have F-16 fighters, fighter planes coming flying over Nablus. Why? <laughs> to terrorize. Yeah, to terrorize people. There's no Palestinian Air Force here. <laughs> yeah, there's no airport. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you think the Tel Aviv protests are actually, uh, has anyone written on this, do you know, of the Tel Aviv, of the J-14 Tel Aviv protests actually echoing, you know, uh, forgotten, submerged strands of early socialist Zionism? They don't know about Splintism. It's been suppressed. Or Bundism, but not even Bundism, the, uh, the early Zionists who were They don't know anything about the socialist uh, predecessors like Rosa Luxemburg or... or uh, or even the Zionists, like Gordon. I mean, Luxembourg was probably anti-Zionist. Right? Or Bronstein to Trotsky, you know, they don't, they don't know yeah. about this at all, except, you know, for those families who transmitted the information to their children. This has been effectively suppressed by the Zionist educational system. 
So was there a, like a civil war between the uh, an ideological civil war between the socialists and the early nineteen hundreds who became Zionists and those who who became Bundists? Did people like uh, you know A. D. Gordon and you know Burke? Uh, Bear, what's his name? Oh, Bear, uh, Bear, 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 Bear. Yeah, yeah. Did, did he was a, he was a sort of a, a social democratic Zionist, you know, who had this theory that since the Jews were an inverted pyramid, and they had a, a, a smaller working class in proportion to the uh, middle class than would otherwise be found in other uh, cultures, mm -hmm. that uh, this pyramid needed to be uh, <coughs> turned around by the form by means of the formation of a nation state. Which would uh, transform uh, Jewish people into working class people mm -hmm. uh, because they would adopt the position, positions in that society that uh, uh, the working class. And that uh, incidentally called for the, um, um, the boycott of Palestinian labor. Yeah, yeah. So, and the formation of the Institute, which was exclusively Jewish at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it was a racist socialist theory. Yeah. Of of uh, of a Jewish working class formation, but subordinate to a bourgeois theory mm -hmm. of Zionism. Mm -hmm. So it's it's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, so the social Zionists, you know, are sort of reactionary at the same time as being supposedly socialist. You know, mm -hmm. it didn't work. Their theory of socialism did not work, mm -hmm. and the, the writers have now taken over uh, because uh, socialist Zionism is not uh, logical. Mm -hmm. You know, and Zionism as an ideology leads to a rightist uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. It's the true nature of Zionism. I found this quote on the internet. Um, the tragic pe peculiarities of Jewish society could not be eliminated by seeking to isolate it from decaying capitalist society as a whole. The, the, the inverted pyramid of the Jews could not possibly be reversed in, in Israel while the normal py pyramid of other peoples was itself in the process are crumbling apart, and uh, the world proletarian revolution is alone capable of normalizing Jewish history. And within the framework of decaying capitalism, no solution is possible. Is that how you see a kind of a, you, you know, because the new international boons would repeat the idea of the old boondists that uh, uh, Jewish emancipation, so to speak, is only possible to capitalists through the destruction of capitalism. No. The Bund was, uh, went further than that. That was the Marxist theory. Mm. The Marxist theory of, uh, of Jewish liberation, in uh, Marxist uh, pamphlet uh, on the Jewish question, theorized that the Jews would be liberated as Jews and would be liberated from capitalism uh, by the anti-capitalist revolution, and that Jews had to liberate themselves from themselves, according to Marx, because Jews were creating capitalism. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Jews were small merchants, mm -hmm. and they were selling things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they were capitalists, supposedly, nascent capitalists. Even the, uh, and the reason why not. Jews were merchants is because the Christian employers would not employ Jews as workers. Mm -hmm. So Jews had to form their own uh, ghetto economies, mm -hmm. just as the Palestinians here now do the same. They have all these workshops all over the place. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of you know small businessmen all over the place here in Nablus mm -hmm. with these small workshops that are producing very fine goods. And that's what the Jews were. For. That's what the Jews were. The same thing, you know. That doesn't mean you know that the Jews wanted to be capitalists or wanted to be merchants. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that they were forced to be so. Yeah, that doesn't even fit the definition uh, of a capitalist in Marxist terms. A capitalist would be someone who employs others' labor power to leach the profits off of it. Yes. Not an option. Yes. Well, well they, the small merchants here, they do employ a certain number of workers, you know, mm -hmm. maybe five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, but, uh, this is, you know, this is exaggerated out of all proportion by Marx. But and so also the Jews role as money lenders and uh, that, that people like Marx. Well, and there were some Jewish money yeah. lenders, yes. There were some non Jewish money lenders, but the Jews were better at it than the uh, Christian money lenders because they had an international network. Uh, but the number of Jews who were money lenders was, you know, how, how many Jewish money lenders could there be? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, 12, you know, <laughs> please. You know? <laughs> okay.
What does that got to do with the Jewish people? Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, so, but all of a sudden, you know, Jews were usurers according to Shakespeare. Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice is racist, it's anti Semitic. And the Christians have not even come to realize that. It's a very big problem of anti Semitism that exists still. And uh, it is uh, incorrect to say that anti Semitism has passed away. You know, at the very least, one could say that it is latent or unconscious. Unconscious uh, anti Semitism. You know, a lot of will say, will begin by saying, I'm not an anti Semite, but. You know that sort of thing? Yeah, well, that's called latent, you know, anti Semitism. Yeah, yeah. What's the bad followed by? Yeah, by some insult or another. Yeah. Now, look, I'm not uh, anti Semitic, but I'm not kind of the Jews as a question themselves. Yes. For people to understand. And this is prop being, was propagated amongst the Arabs as well by the Nazi movement, you know, when it was flourishing. They intervened in the uh, Arab countries to promote. Uh, anti-Jewish propaganda, mm -hmm. like the publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which still circulates yeah. and now is replicated in various forms. I would say that the book by Walt Meisner, The Zionist Lobby, is an update of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Yes. Because they have slipped into referring to it as a Jewish lobby, and they also support the idiot called Gila Altsman, who is a former Israeli uh, uh, Zionist, who became supposedly anti Zionist, but in fact became a Christian uh, anti Jewish uh, propagandist. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he can play saxophone, he should stick to that and not uh, try to pretend that he's a political philosopher. Mm -hmm. But, um, you, like, you can't, you know, Mirsheimer and Walt, even though they may slip into Protocols of the of Zion and talk and call you a Jewish lobby, you can't deny the attention and this role of. Okay, there's, there's a lobby in America. Oh yeah, there's a lobby, yes. But, but, the, mistake is, but the mistake is to think that it is a dominant force in American political culture. Because how can one say that APEC, which is based upon 2% uh, of the population in the United States, is more powerful than the 30% of the population in the United States, which follows the Christian evangelical movement, which is pro-Zionist, mm -hmm. and which controls the Republican Party now. And which now controls the Congress, mm -hmm. and which you know cut off funding you know to the Palestine Authority because uh, they had applied for uh, independent uh, recognition you know by the General Assembly by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Congress, United States Congress, which cut off funding you know to the PA, mm -hmm. and later on you know had to re uh, re reestablish it because. Uh, provides for the security apparatus, which mm -hmm. calms things down here for Israel. Israel actually asked the Congress to reestablish its funding for the PA. Mm -hmm. About a month after, they cut it off. Mm -hmm. But they cut off the funding, not because of the Zionist lobby, not because of Israel, you know, and the proof is that Israel asked them to reinst reinstate the funding, mm -hmm. because of the Christian uh, mentality that infects a third, a third of the American population, mm -hmm. which considers that Israel is a proper place for Jews to be, Jew, Jew, uh, Jewish Americans, mm -hmm. and uh, which actually promotes the idea of the United States as a Christian nation state, and uh, in effect, you know, thinks that the Jewish Americans should go to Israel and leave the United States to them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the tendency that is dominant, not APEC. It is far more powerful. It obviously controls the Congress. Mm -hmm. It obviously controls the Republican Party. Obviously controls the Tea Party movement. Do you, do you think that APAC has, or, or more broadly, Israel's concerns have any role in the in U.S. interventions in the Middle East since 9/11 in terms of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Or uh, they supported those interventions, interventions, yes, but you know. It is not so simple. Yeah. When you consider the war between Iraq and Iran, for instance, under Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. the United States supported who? Iraq. Mm -hmm. Who did Israel support? Mm -hmm. Israel supported Iran. Because they didn't want Iraq to become very powerful. Yes. So, where is this you know, coincidence of Israel and the United States you know, uh, foreign policy? There is none. So, the gesture of of, you know, pointing to Israeli interest as the main explanation for American foreign policy is almost kind of anti-Semitic because of that. 
Yes. It's totalized and de yes. totalized. It's just a... Uh, I think it's motivated by an unconscious yes. uh, part of the real design. That's right. It's the protocols of the other design, mm -hmm. which is designed as fabrication. They were just trying to say that the Jews were controlling the world. And then the Nazis used this to say that the Jews had, uh, had controlled the, uh, Europe to the extent that they caused the First World War and caused the defeat of Germany. Mm -hmm. It was all the Jews, the Jews' fault, mm -hmm. you know? No, this is insidious propaganda mm -hmm. and it affects uh, great sectors uh, of, uh, of thought, mm -hmm. including uh, Arab political culture, including the Palestine Solidarity Movement, including the Jewish political culture itself. Some of oh, many of the scientists believe that mm -hmm. themselves, you know, and they think, oh yes, this is good. Believe that they control the world? Yeah. Do you also think it's, uh, tell me some of the ways that you think anti-Semitism, you know, if it's latent or unconscious, has um, infected the Jewish anti-Zionist movement? Do you think that it has in, in some ways? I mean, is there like a strong, you know, uh, assimilationist tendency, uh, uh, at least? In yeah, so yes, very strong, but it is declining, you know. In, this, in the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, I used to go to the Jewish Marxists, the Jewish leftists, and say, look, you've got to speak out, you know, in solidarity with the Palestinians. It's your responsibility as a Jewish person. And they would reply, I'm not Jewish, I'm a Marxist. Mm -hmm. Okay. 10, 20 years later, all of a sudden, after 2000, when the Palestinian Intifada breaks out again, and they realize that this is, you know, a major political phenomenon in world politics, mm -hmm. And they have matured enough to realize that they should be playing, that they should be paying attention to international politics and not just their provincial politics. I say, oh yes, we support the Palestinians now. And they came into the Palestine, uh, the Jewish Palestinian solidarity movements, mm -hmm. but as Marxists. And they considered that they were speaking out then as Jewish people, which they had refused to do so before. Mm -hmm. They took this on, you know as an identity because it got them the attention of the Christian public, which was willing to listen to an anti-Zionist, you know, or an anti-occupation critique. Mm -hmm. From a Jewish perspective. From a Jewish perspective, because they got a voice. Mm -hmm. They were listened to. The media actually wanted to speak, them to speak out. Mm -hmm. Because there was a debate about, you know, what Israel was doing to the Palestinians. You know, because the Palestinians were revolting. Why were they revolting? Mm -hmm. Why was this happening? They were supposed to be living, you know, in a happy paradise, you know, provided by the Zionist movement. Okay, so good, they come to the movement, you know, but then they reject working in the Jewish community itself. They would only go and speak to the Christian community mm. as Jews because it gave them a voice. But working amongst the Jews, no, they rejected the Jewish community because they considered the Jewish community to be hopelessly Zionist, which wasn't the case. Otherwise, they'd be living in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, but they never even thought of this, they haven't thought through, but they're doing it all. So the Jewish Marxists who come into the Palestine Solidarity Movement went into it to exploit it politically, opportunistically. And they still have to learn you know, how to really provide true solidarity for the Palestinian people because they're not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. There's, this is a tension that still exists today. For instance, in Canada, we formed the uh, uh, Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians. Mm -hmm. And uh, all sorts of Jewish Marxists came to join it after um, I and Michael Benazon founded it. And later they split off and formed Independent Jewish Voices of Canada because they couldn't uh, bring themselves to differentiate uh, themselves from the Palestine Solidarity Movement activists who carried anti-Jewish verbiage with them. For instance, the first point of disagreement was about the Gaza War. Now, some called this a Holocaust. It has a Holocaust of family survivor. I pointed out this was not a Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That it was uh, a piece of propaganda to do so, and it would do not service the Palestinians to use language like that because, you know, anybody who would alienate the Zionists even further. It would have been. Well, it would alienate one, the Jewish people. Yeah. It would uh, not serve to educate the Zionists, and it would turn off the Christians who would be thinking, you know, that this is, you know, exaggerated you know, propaganda. This sure. actually has a a certain anti-Semitic bent to it, and therefore they didn't want to uh, go for it. They wouldn't, you know, like uh, be convinced by it. And if they were, then uh, what a terrible thing they were doing, you know, if they were bringing Christians to, to some anti-Semitic inclusion. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, others went even further, like 
you know, ex-Israelis like Israel Shamir and Gilad Altsman, who started to use Christian anti-Semitic rhetoric, like the Jews killed Jesus Christ, they would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and they're doing the same to the Palestinians now. Mm -hmm. Not just the Zionists, they would say the Jews, mm -hmm. you know, as a whole, are doing this. Yeah. You know, so that this is anti-Jewish. It's not anti-Semitic. But what John Austin seems to do to me is he locates uh, the, the root of Zionist evil in Jewish identity, identity. Yeah. yeah, in Jewishness. He doesn't know what Jewishness is. He doesn't know anything about the Jewish people. He was educated as a Zionist, and uh, he knows nothing of Jewish political culture. Well, he, uh, at least in his, in his musical career, he actually does a lot of what uh, things you were saying earlier as. A Jewish person should do. And music is a, a fusion of many different, uh, many different cultures. It has to be international. Yeah, yes, as he says himself, he was inspired by African American jazz, you know. But he doesn't know what he is, what he's doing, and what he's saying. He's not politically educated. He's very ignorant. Mm -hmm. It's incredible, you know, that so many people will actually read it. What he has, what he puts out as his writings, which I don't even believe he writes himself. Mm -hmm. Really? You don't think he read for himself? No. Same with Israel Shamir. I saw Israel Shamir speaking in one time. He can barely speak in English. And then he's writing, you know, English uh, uh, prose, you know, political prose. No, he's not writing that stuff. He's, he's a front man for a right wing organization. Mm. Um, so, what happened to, to the Bund after World War II? It was basically destroyed, but then didn't many of some Buddhists come and become leftist Zionists of Israel? Some went to live in Israel because, as you may know, 48% of the Jewish refugees after the Holocaust went to live in Israel because they couldn't get a visa to go to live in the name of the country. 52% right. chose to go to uh, the United States or Canada, uh, but it took a while for, uh, for my, my father, for instance, to get a visa to go to Canada, even though his sister was inviting him to do so as a Canadian citizen. Because Canada didn't want to have Jewish refugees coming there. Mm. So it was very difficult to get a visa to go to any other country. So many of the Jewish survivors, and uh, who were Buddhists, of course, you know, ended up going to Israel, but they were certainly not in the leadership of the science movement. Mm. They were just living there as Holocaust survivors, in poverty, in isolation, and afraid of speaking out. Mm. They were suppressed. Mm. So now we have to assert ourselves. We have to take on our responsibility, and we have to take pride mm -hmm. in what we have preserved as Jewish political thought, mm -hmm. and we launch it, you know, for the benefit of all the Jewish people and for the benefit of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. well, well, what are some of the gems of Jewish political thought that we have preserved that we should take pride in? This concept of national cultural autonomy. This applies not only to the Jewish people; it applies in many, many different contexts. The Palestinian people, in some ways, are they? They want their own. No. National cultural autonomy applies to the Israelis. Mm -hmm. In what sense? When you have a united society here, you know we have an integrated territory. Mm -hmm. You know there is a lot of Israelis who live in the West Bank now. There are still a lot of Palestinians who live in Israel as citizens. You know, one and a half million. You know, and neither is going to be leaving. So, you know, there is no territorial, territorial contiguity in order to form a separate Palestinian nation state. Oh, so you think that a lot of the one state, two state verbal battles are actually operating from a flawed paradigm of nation state? That's right, both are. I spoke about this, you know, at Nasha University last week. Oh, yeah, Nasha. And I provided a third uh, opinion to the one state and the two state uh, solution theorists. Now, you have to get out of that segregationist uh, mentality uh, because uh, the problem, you know, because you can't separate, you know, the peoples into two states, two nation states, first of all, okay, you know, it would be disaster, you know, and it's also the same, you know, idea in, in a certain sense as the right-wing Zionists who want to remove the presence of the Palestinians and put them into ghettos, and new stands. You know, in the West Bank somewhere, with the Tommy. Now, the one state solution, it provides for a democratic secular Palestine, the old PLO formula, which is a, uh, a state formation which would be based upon one homogeneous culture. In other words, you know, it would be pretending that there would be one nation for one state. 
there would be no differentiation between all the citizens. Everybody would have equal civil Voting rights. And civil rights. Right. Equal rights, yeah. But this doesn't work because there's an inequality between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Israelis are rich compared to the Palestinians. You know, so what is supposed to happen? The Palestinians are supposed to be forming a lower working class, you know, who works as hewers of water, and, you know, for, for the Israelis forever and ever? Mm -hmm. No, this is the same sort of parallel that exists in Canada between the French Canadians and the English Canadians. The French Canadians were supposed to be, according to the Durham report, the hewers of water and the, the drawers of water and the hewers of wood. Yeah, that's true. You know, the biblical formula. Yeah. yeah. You know, no way. You know, this is what is, le is lent to by the one state solution. You know, it's not sufficient. One has to have autonomy for each nation so they can have their own independence within a social federation. And with their autonomy, they can have their, their, their own development. They can promote their own development without being supported economically or politically mm -hmm. to the other nation. How, how could that? Uh, furthermore, furthermore, one state solution doesn't work because you know it doesn't allow for the return of the refugees because if they're saying, oh yes, we're all mixed, you know, so let's have a, you know, an equal society here. But what about the refugees? It doesn't allow for the return of the refugees, you know, because how is it to be decided that the refugees are going to return? You know, so you know you have an election. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Israelis win because they have 50 plus one votes, they're not going to allow the refugees to return. If the Palestinians, if the Palestinians were to win the election, 50 plus one votes, you say, oh, now we're going to invite the refugees back, then there would be civil war. Mm -hmm. So the one-state solution as a concept does not function, does not work. Mm -hmm. You have to have national cultural autonomy for the Israelis, so they can have their own language, their own schools, their own religion if they want, mm -hmm. their own administration, mm -hmm. you know? And they can have their own autonomy, but they have to live together with the Palestinians who will have their own autonomy as well. And this allows for the return of the refugees because there's no automatic majority anymore. It's not majority rule anymore in a liberal democracy. It doesn't work here. Well, how, could there, how could there be two, uh, two governmental apparatuses? Ah, because you have each government forming a federative council on a proportional basis. And each allocate resources to their own people on, on that basis. But within each people, within each nation, they have their own legal system, their own schools, etc., etc., etc. You know, so nobody can complain that they're being dominated by the other. They can have what they want. So there would be two separate systems bridged by a federated council. That's right. Now, how do you develop this? How is this constructed? By a mechanism called the Constituent Assembly in which you have the delegates from various civil society organizations, here and internationally, amongst the refugees, coming together and deciding by consensus how such a society will be federated and formed up. So they would have to agree and be Yes, there would have to be accommodation by means of national cultural autonomy, which is the mechanism by which there is a consensus formed. Mm -hmm. And then over time, do you, do you think uh, some of those separate yeah, governmental and cultural institutions could crossbreed and influence each other in a healthy and productive way where one is not in the other? Yes, because there's going to be, you know, uh, it's obviously going to be mixing. There is going to be Jewish Palestinian dual identities formed. You know, there are going to be families that are going to be formed. And there are going to be children that are both Jewish and Palestinian. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be integration. Mm -hmm. Those who don't want to integrate, you know, their families don't have to, but it's not going to be forbidden. Right now in Israel, you can only get married by an Orthodox rabbi or by an imam. That is, you either have to remain Jewish or you have to remain Muslim. It is forbidden. There are Christian marriages? Yes, I suppose. Yeah. But you know, I'm talking about yeah. two major. Yeah. You know, it is forbidden for Jewish people to be married with Palestinians. It is also forbidden for Palestinians to be married with other Palestinians who live in the West Bank. That's another problem. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, the ridiculousness of the situation, you know, compounds itself enormously. So do you think within this, uh, this federation of, you know, that allows for natural cultural autonomy, would there be any overarching uh, country designation? I mean, like, the way that... Oh, what the name of the country would be, for yeah. instance, yeah. 
you know, people can call the country what they want, but uh, they will come to a common agreement, you know, for legal purposes. Uh, to call it probably the Federation of uh, Israel Palestine or the Federation of Palestine Israel have a dual name or something like that. You know, no problem, no big deal. Or it could just be called Canaan, the original name of the country. Canaan, yeah. You know, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. Do you think that uh, uh, you know, the world could be re restructured in this way? In the yes, future? Canada has to be restructured in that way. Otherwise, Quebec is going to separate from Canada. I live in Quebec. Mm -hmm. The last referendum voted 49.3% in favor of independence, separating from Canada. Mm -hmm. Canada offered to change the constitution of the country to accommodate Quebec in a special way, recognizing that it had a national character to it called special status. Never did it. Yeah. It didn't do it. And it never changed the constitution. So right. Quebec is still treated as a province like the other ten provinces. And it is not allocated resources on a proportional basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Quebecers, uh, or in English, or the Quebecois in French, you know, do not accept this condition. And uh, there are various uh, movements which call for the uh, independence of Quebec. Even the uh, socialist uh, movement, you know, which is called Quebec Solidaire, which is independent of the middle class party called Parti Québécois. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two independence, four independence parties in Quebec, and there is uh, two parties that are for um, autonomy of one sort or another, both of which come from the liberal bourgeois direction. All the parties in Quebec are in favor of uh, Quebec identity in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And Canada, the English Canadians, even the Canadian leftists, have not come to this realization. Mm -hmm. So it applies to Quebec, national cultural autonomy, if it is to remain in the Canadian Federation, and Canada calls itself a federation. It applies to any other country that has an indigenous population that has been displaced or genocided or, mm -hmm. you know, this, uh, the indigenous population require their national autonomy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to assimilate to some sort of colonial culture that has taken over their country. Mm -hmm. So do we end it up to imperialism or a way to transcend? That's it. It's the antidote to an internal imperialism. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So this has been an excellent, you know, discussion, you know, yeah. that I haven't had with anybody else. This is not written down. This is an original documentary piece of work that you've done. Well, I congratulate mm -hmm. you, Ben. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, I wish that uh, people would pay attention to uh, this uh, piece of work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll put it on the internet. Very, very good. Okay.